and we are also recording. Can everybody hear me? Good. Audio, awesome. Excited to have everybody here today. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are, however you're tuning in, whether you're on the Zoom with us right now or you're tuning in uh, you know, on Facebook Live. We appreciate you for being here. We're excited to learn with you. My name is Caleb Talley. I'm the Director of Marketing and Events uh, at Startup Junkie. For those of you who may not be familiar with our organization, uh, we are a mission-driven, high-impact organization based here in Northwest Arkansas. Our office is right here on the Fayetteville Square, and I was just commenting a second ago that it's sunny today, so I see everybody out and about walking around, and I'm very jealous of them being out in the sunshine today. Uh, Startup Junkie supports, inspires, and educates entrepreneurs and innovators by providing no-cost one-on-one consulting events, workshops, programs, things just like this that you're in now, of course, virtual uh, for the time being. Um, we remove barriers for historically underserved populations by democ democratizing access to entrepreneurial resources and providing strategic support to indiv individuals seeking to establish or grow their businesses. Uh, and like I said, we do that uh, through one-on-one -on -one consulting and events. Those are the primary uh, facets about what, how we do that. Uh, you'll never get a bill from Startup Junkie. Uh, we provide all of our services at absolutely no cost. So our events are free, our consulting is free, and we're very excited today to have uh, our special guest, Andrew Gibbs Dabney. Uh, he is a friend of Startup Junkie, has been for a long time. He's the founder and CEO of Lives and Designs, lives and creates versatile and sustainable apparel design to last longer. Andrew is dedicated to values of sustain sustainability and conscious capitalism. He truly believes business success and social progress go hand in hand, and he has built lives in on these ideals from day one. And in the meantime, he's just so happened to become Arkansas's Kickstarter ninja, and we're excited for him to impart some of his knowledge on us today. So without further ado, Andrew, I will turn it over to you. Cool, thank you. I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad that Startup Junkie puts on such awesome webinars so regularly. And uh, as Caleb said, like, Yes, I'm very much a friend of Startup Junkie, and, and they've been very instrumental in, in doing what we've been doing since the very beginning. Um, I hung around there, around the office back when I was at Fayetteville, after I left. Um, in the meantime, helped with ideating some things, helped with another business I was working with, and helped with, you know, a lot of the very beginnings of Lives In, and even some of the ongoing tasks that we've needed to handle. So amazing resource and I'm always happy to jump on and do whatever I can to help back out the uh, Startup Junkie team. So today's webinar um, is about Kickstarter and best practices around Kickstarter. Um, I guess to go over the bona fides here, this will be the third Kickstarter campaign or this, this one that we just executed was our third Kickstarter campaign for Libsyn that I have uh, basically managed. And as we'll talk about through the first, second, third, it's not me at all by myself. There's a whole lot of people, a whole lot of moving parts and a whole lot of things to consider when you go into a Kickstarter campaign. Um, previously before having run anything for my own company, I was involved in Fayetteville's Kickstarter campaign way back in the day for a backpack, um, which was kind of a small scale project uh, as part of our marketing for a bag launch back then. And I was very much on the periphery. I just kind of saw the platform and, and <clears throat> some of the ways in which you go about doing it for this particular webinar so you don't have to sit here and just look at me and my uh, our new offices kind of boring backdrop the whole time i might screen share for some of it and we have a rough outline so if you will humor me for one minute i'm going to share my screen and we will start with our can everybody see this right now over here? My mat, like my window and what's Looks going good. on? Cool. Yeah. So we will uh, present. So what we're going to cover is basically a high level. And we also want to be able to have time to get to a thorough question and answer session, which will be probably where the meat of what we're going to cover is, is talked about. So we have a pre campaign, which is, in Kickstarter world, where almost 90% of the work happens is before you ever go live. And so as you think about going into a Kickstarter, don't forget the second part of that word, which is Kickstarter campaign. It is very much a campaign. It's not a battle. It's not one 
thing. It is a long-term effort that starts way before you launch the 30 day window or 45 or whatever you choose to way after you actually finish up that live crowdfunding event. Um, then we'll go into promotion, um, some helpful tips, some misconceptions, and then the post campaign process. And then we'll get to questions. So feel free to stop as I go through and ask a question or uh, even better, throw a question into the chat and uh, we can get back there and address things that come up along the way. So with pre-campaign, um, there's some obvious steps, um, some non-obvious steps, and I'm going to try my best to not look at my little outline here so I don't get lost and forget some of the things that come up naturally. But the number one uh, thing you need for a Kickstarter campaign is a product. Oh, and this also applies to Indiegogo. Both platforms don't let you just bring an idea to the table. Um, you need to have a prototype and a working prototype and be able to prove that that prototype actually exists. And usually that is that proof is just through photos, right? You have photos and video of this product. It obviously exists in the real world. The thing that, and this will jump a little bit ahead to misconceptions, but I'll address it now. There is a misconception, not just in, in um, Kickstarter and crowdfunding world, but also just in general life that there's this, if you build it, they will come mentality that you can just build a great product and by the sense of you building a great product that it will go viral and everybody's going to want to tell their family about it. And you're just going to get millions of dollars. Virality, except for very few exceptions is a myth. Um, virality is usually more of like you have something that hits a megaphone. So it's more of a network effect than a viral effect. So you have something that hits someone with a big audience and then it then goes to a massive audience, right? And those things don't happen by accident. Those things happen through hard work on the front end. Um, and the first step in that is audience building before you ever go live. Um, as I'm gonna jump back in and out of this thing right here um, to be able to show y'all some of the meat and potatoes while we talk. So this is our third Kickstarter campaign. Um, as you can see, we recently just raised $514,000, but our first campaign raised 78,000 and our second raised 105. And so the $78,000 one is probably the most notable in the sense that we didn't have any brand recognition. We had no one that knew who lives and was you know, months before we had ever, um, oops, sorry. You can see me kind of fumbling around. This is how you know it's live. And now everything is gray. We'll go over here. Um, and for the time being, I'll just stop my share. So you can see me again. So the uh, pre-campaign process, building an audience, how did we go from basically no one, something that no one had ever heard of, no one had ever seen this logo. We really didn't even have a product when we started launching a Kickstarter campaign. And the thing that is a misconception again, that needs to be gotten over is basically, if you build it, they will come. I have this product, I'm working on it. I need to keep it top secret. And that is one of the things that I see all the time is people keep what they're working on top secret. With lives in and the way that we built up an audience pre-launch was by sharing every single step along the way and not getting held up or worked up by this idea of someone's going to come in and steal our design. Someone's going to steal the idea or the brand and go do it before us. Um, both in Kickstarter world and also general business world, most of the times your competitors are pretty wrapped up in what they're doing and they don't really care what you're doing. Um, and also no one is usually going to do what you are going to do better than you could. And so I encourage people to basically take the lid off. If you're coming up with a board game, um, start talking about the fact that you are coming up with a board game. Um, if you have an idea of what the name's going to be and the strategy behind it, you know, at least some of the brand, go ahead and make a social media account. Go ahead and make your, all your social channels, make an email list and make a website. Make that website simple. Say we're going to launch on Kickstarter in 2022. It doesn't need to be any more detailed than that because you don't actually know when you're going to launch. Even if you did, you, you really don't. Um, so, Go ahead and get the content out there and start talking about what you're going to do. For lives in that looked like our brand values. 
on our website, we actually, I started this whole thing with the process of writing down the values and the reason and the why behind the brand before we ever shared a product. And so what we do is we put out ads on the very front end saying, we're making clothing for people who value experiences over stuff. Does that sound like you sign up for this email list and get a free sticker? So we kind of had a carrot, right? We were sending out these free stickers. I don't have one exactly near me, um, but they were fairly cheap to make. Um, that, that was a logistical nightmare to actually send out all those stickers. Um, so I'm not sure I would really recommend it, but it was effective. It wasn't scalable, but it was effective. So before that first launch of $78,000 on, on Kickstarter, we actually built up an email audience of, of I think it was around 13 or 14,000 people on that. Um, so, and most of those people did not come because of our product. They, did, they were actually in our audience and on our list and followed us on social media because they believed in this idea of owning less things. Uh, they were outdoors people that wanted to minimize their gear closet. They were attracted to what we were saying we were going to do and not even as much to the product that we ended up making. Um, so that first campaign was successful and it brought us to um, where we are today. I'm going to go back and screen share again so I can show you actually what this looks like. All right. Can y'all see my screen? Do you see a blank desktop right now? Yes. We can, we can see the, well, well, I was going to say we could see the Kickstarter page. Okay, cool. It's uh, when I have two desktops up, it's sometimes a little bit uh, not clear. This is that first campaign. So you can see our $78,000 right here. And then our second campaign was actually for a revamped version of these pants. So we launched the High Wolf Fleece and the Flex Canvas Pants per first. Two products in one campaign, something I would not recommend doing because it's overly complex. It makes your pledges over here, which is how people back you a little bit more complicated in the back end complicated. The second campaign, so this is about a year later after we had shipped all of the pre-ordered pants and fleeces, sold out of pants, and then got a ton of customer feedback. And then we went into version two, launched version two, new and improved did $106,000 more backers and actually were profitable on that, which we can kind of get into a talk and question and answer about the, the economics of Kickstarter. And then as you can see, our third campaign was 500,000. So to go back to my forever grayed out presentation, um, you know what? We'll throw it out the window um, and I will stop screen sharing for a minute. The <clears throat> main basically pre-launch thing to keep in mind is the audience building. You want to come to the campaign with an audience already there. Like I said, it was 13,000 at the time of our first launch. Our second one was around 22,000 on our email list as far as that number. And then most recently we we're about 35 or 40,000 depending on how you kind of slice up our email list. And that, uh, has been huge. On day one of each campaign, the email has been the number one driver of conversions and it's number one thing that brings your number one day dollars up, which basically Kickstarter is algorithm based. So one of the other tips is make sure you get as many sales as you can on day one and even better in hour one. Um, that audience you build up at the beginning really doesn't need to be overly complicated. You can start with who's closest to you your friends, your family, your business associates, startup junkie, have them help, right? Startup junkie on our first, second and third campaign was nice enough to basically share it when we went live because we're an Arkansas company. And so that's not a, a, an isolated thing. You find the people, the organizations that are close to you and they're absolutely gonna be your easiest people, not only to convert into customers, but to share your campaign. So you're building up an audience you are letting them know when you're going to launch as you get closer and you are encouraging everybody to back you as soon as you go live because that algorithm of kickstarter and uh indiegogo works on basically volume and time so the more you do in the earliest time kickstarter sees that in their algorithm you rank higher up in the page than you otherwise would and your cold and kind of ticket for kickstarter land is to get on the front page it's to get up higher on the algorithm so the organic traffic on Kickstarter finds you. 
Um, cause you can only do so much with your audience. You can only do so much with your ad spend and, uh, Kickstarter itself is a massive platform. I think it's like 7 million page views or unique visitors every month. Those people are your customers. You will bring in your audience. Your job with your audience and your fans is to kind of game that algorithm so that it shows your campaign and your great product to more people that are naturally on the platform. Um, it's very good for customer discovery that way. And we can talk about this later in the, in the questions too, but it is a customer discovery platform. It is a marketing platform. Uh, that's what it's really is there for to do is to acquire customers and get fans and uh, and sell something so a um, couple other topics on pre-campaign um, you got to build it and the best thing I can tell you about that from like an actual design perspective is to go to the most successful campaigns that are like what you've done and mimic those so if you're familiar with app development wireframe it you know if they started with a gif you in the top three all started with a gif of the product in motion you should start with a GIF of the product in motion. If they started with press and they gotten some press reviews or some user uh, social proof, so user reviews, you should start with social proof or user reviews so that you are basically looking, uh, feeling, sounding, and smelling like the most successful campaigns in your space. That way you're building trust. The hardest thing about a Kickstarter is overcoming a trust barrier. People know that Kickstarters aren't guaranteed to send. And especially as an unknown company, unknown brand, unknown person, you have to convince them that you're going to actually ship that product and it's gonna be like what you sold it for. And the best way you can do that is to look and feel like the real thing. So that just means you invest into uh, product design, I mean, sorry, graphic design, you invest into video design, you invest in that page. Um, the last step on pre-campaign, should you choose to do it, is choosing a marketing partner. Um, our first campaign, two campaigns, we accepted the help of a marketing partner after we launched. So if you launch and you're moderately successful, your inbox will blow up with, I want to help you make this thing bigger. Um, we used a firm like that for the first two and we had some more success than we would have had we not, but it's not the best way to do it. On our third campaign, this one that just did half a million, we went and found the best partner that we could find in the world that had done campaigns for similar things like we had done and said we wouldn't to work with you. And we actually had to try out, we actually had to pay up front a testing fee to do a photo shoot on their behalf, a video shoot, and for them to run ads on Facebook to a landing page just to make sure that they could actually market what we did and our audience liked what we were planning to make. And then they said, yes, we'll work with you or we won't work with you. And in our case, they said, yes. Hmm. So moving on, um, promotion basically is during the campaign. So this preparation work goes beginning in the beginning, but you, you built up this audience, you have a marketing partner, you have social accounts. Hopefully you've done some testing. That's another part like that we did through our marketing partner, but you can do on your own. So if you have like say Facebook or Instagram business and you can basically make a landing page or a website for an email sign up and you can test ads ahead of time to try to figure out what works, what brings people in. Um, caveat to all this is you don't need to pay. You can do a smaller scale campaign without pay promotion just based on your audience and if you kind of get some of that uh, social referral going on. But assuming you want to do a big campaign, there will be a paid aspect to that. And usually it's Facebook and Instagram, a little bit of Google that goes into that. So you're testing. Um, so on actual promotion, there's you won't go too deep into all this, but email, like I said, on day one is your most powerful tool. Your social channels, your, I mean, just everything personal to you and your team. Share that far and wide. Share the campaign, share why it's cool. Um, more importantly, tell people like why why they, why you need their support. You know, because those are, like I said, those are your first, those are your first backers. And um, on like your friends and family on your like day of launch emails, like we are live right now, you cannot be overly simple or overly explanatory on that. Like we actually put in, like to all my friends and family, I put in like, we're live right now, please back us on Kickstarter. And then there was like a link. It's like, what is Kickstarter? <laughs> How does Kickstarter work? And then I actually screenshotted the campaign and put a big red arrow down to the pledge button and said, this is what you push. And then I put, you will not be charged. You'll be charged later. 
And then I put another note because this is a misconception of your friends and family is that they want to wait till the last day, like day 30 to like push you over the edge. So you need to kind of explain, don't do that. Like that's really helpful. And I love the thought or sorry, I love the thought, but it's not very helpful. We want you to do it on the first day because that actually helps us out. Um, on ours, uh, we did our marketing partner on the first two had like a PR package that you could buy. It was a couple thousand dollars and they would say, oh, we get you guaranteed placements. So we did that both times, which got us some kind of Kickstarter watch list, product type style, email blasts and articles that would divert back to our campaign. And that mm, probably wasn't worth it on this because we just didn't really make a lot of money back to what we paid for the placements. On this third one we did, we have a PR firm now as a company and we actually worked ahead of time on two things. One was pre-launch like uh, social proof. So we sent out our pants to a bunch of press that had previously covered lives and said, hey, will you try these on, wear them for a month or so and then give us a quote back. All we asked for is a quote, do you like them? And if you don't like them, tell us. Um, that's kind of how that went. So when we launched our third campaign, we had like, you know, men's journal, uh, outdoor or outside, uh, gear junkie, gear patrol, and carryology that were pre launch press reviews that gave us a lot of credibility when we launched that, hey, these people that are very well respected and know their shit stuff. I apologize. Um, say these pants are good. The second part of press, um, for us at least, was getting some actual live campaign articles that would pop up and point back to the campaign on day one and so some of those were from our closer press relationships that they had actually wrote the article way ahead of time and said when do you want us to publish it it takes some time to build that kind of relationship where you can ask the press to write something and then not publish until later it will happen eventually um, but the other part of it is basically just building a press kit and you can do this and this makes it basically what you're trying to do is make it easy to support you make it easy to cover and so this can be as simple as a google drive folder that you have a link to at the bottom of your campaign that's open to anybody and make sure it's shareable. It's not like a closed folder. And it has, here's images of our product. Here's graphics of our product. Here's videos of our product. And here's like a fact sheet. So it's like one word document with everything, that, you know, kind of everything about your product, about your team, about your story, and then like little folders for photo, video, and graphics. So that if and when you are successful in the press, especially local press, want to write something, you make it very easy to do that. Um, step two, that's like your baseline. It's playing defense. They can come get it. Second, second part of press is writing press releases. Um, you can kind of go deep into that. But my number one tip on writing a press release is basically write the article exactly as you want it written and send that. Because if you do that, the press, the people in the press that are very busy, that have all this stuff coming across their desk, see that as that's an easy thing, right? You've already written it. All they need to do is basically take it, um, massage it, make it their own words and put their byline on it. And you've got a press article. I cannot stress enough. Don't send them a fact sheet that takes interpretation and work and expect to get an article on it. Send them an article that you wrote well um, and then let them repost it basically. And that does work. Um, other live campaigning campaign stuff is obviously paid social. So if you've been testing kind of before the campaign, you know what, what's working as far as your photo and your words, um, be continuing to do that. Your marketing partner, should you choose to use one is going to do that for you. For our last campaign, we actually use a separate marketing partner than the one that helped us build our campaign to run live ads, because once again, they were the best in the world to do that. We had to try out again but they ran our live ads during the campaign. Um, cross promotions are big live promotions. So basically when the campaign goes live and you have some success, once again, your inbox will fill up with, Hey, I'm so-and-so this is our campaign. We have a thousand backers. We think your stuff is cool. Will you tell your backers about ours and we'll tell our backers about yours. And so that's kind of the same as doing a press kit. If you want to play that game, which I would suggest you should, you basically have like a hero image that you've chosen that represents your product well and a little one sentence blur with a link back to your campaign. And you say, cool, here's ours. Update your backers with our like, you know, image and link and then send us yours. And that actually just kind of helps that, that uh, community spread on Kickstarter. Um, kind of last thing on promotions, we've covered paid email um, emails is like your day of launch, but you should be emailing every few days to continue to grab your audience that missed it saying we're live. 
find ways to do email that's not just like please buy like talk about your product a little bit tell your story you get on there and record a video like this and say like you know this is why it's cool get creative and then the last part of promotion is really organic it's updating your backers that you already have and replying to comments as they come in on the campaign and replying to direct messages um it's very you'll very quickly be able to be spotted as an untrustworthy company if comments are going left replied to sorry if the comments are coming in and not being replied to timely if comments are coming in saying you didn't reply to my direct message i have this question or anything like that or you don't regularly update the update is actually like a feature of these platforms where you can just send like hey you know it's day four we're hit our goal and that awesome like that's all that needs to be it's also an opportunity to tell your story um so that's promotion the last part really is tips and misconceptions uh, before we get to post campaign tips uh one of them we covered look feel smell and sound like the best in the industry for your campaign that is just hands down like you, you're going to get more trust by that than anything else um invest this is goes along with it invest in photo and professional photo and video unless you are a you know really good amateur photo and videographer yourself because that actually just ties right back into that first point um you look and feel professional with and you look like you put effort into it then people are going to respond that way typically outside of kickstarter or anything the more effort you put into something the more you'll get response from people people respond to effort if it looks like you did it half way you're going to get halfway support um and then the last kind of tip is storytelling kickstarter is a pro people want the product but that's not the whole motivation for being active on the platform people want to feel a part of your startup story they want to be a part of what makes this product come to life and so you need to basically give them that story it's part of your obligation for using the platform um if you're just there for transactional you give us money we make product and we go home it's just fine but you're not going to really get out of that community what it can give to you because for us our first kickstarter backers our second and our third are our biggest fans they are our most vocal critics too right which is good you get product feedback but they are there if you take care of them to help promote propel you to the next thing and that's unique to the platform that's not your standard person you picked up from an instagram ad on your website these are people that like know your story so tell them the story um the main misconception we've covered which is like if you build it they will come um you need to build that audience you need to invest in marketing and marketing doesn't always mean paid advertising it's just getting the word out about your campaign um the post campaign which will kind of fly through so we can get to questions um basically you want to track your data um you're going to need some sort of pledge management software kickstarter allows you once again like someone someone backs kickstarter they give you money uh you don't get charged till the last day so they don't actually choose their product options until after that you actually send a survey in our case to say what size and color of pants do you want and in that survey you also have the opportunity to upsell so say you make hats you can say do you want to add on a hat for 25 bucks All right there's an opportunity there a lot of board games and things like that will sell extra game pieces and you know like add basically dlc from a video game basically in real life um extra things that you can make your gaming experience better and there's also different versions of that but there's there's platforms for that um kickstarter has its own survey thing but you can't do any of that upselling in the data management side of it's kind of eh. so there's like backer kit is the biggest one out there they're good so we've used um, we actually use crowdox who backer kit bought so it's the same company and um really that customer nurturing so after the campaign that updates comments questions being responsive on the customer service side is probably every bit as important or more important after that cuz kickstarter campaigns have a notorious history or reputation of just getting the funds and going silent um and not telling everybody in in the absence of information people will assume the worst that's just the way that it is right so if you give them information even if it's bad it's probably not as bad as what they think in their head is what's going on cuz what they think in their head is that you took that money cashed it out went to mexico and you're sitting on a beach right so if you've got a production delay or something came in and you're going to be late it's better to just go say hey we got a production delay we're going to be late really the response that you're going to get and this is held true for us every time we've had to do that is thank you so much for letting us know we're cool 
we're already going to wait six months for it. What's seven, right? That's like the worst response you're going to get. Um, yeah. And then the other thing on Kickstarter, just to keep in mind is you assuming you, you kind of hit, hit a certain level of success. Um, you're going to attract mostly good attention, but you're also going to attract like all the kind of like internet people to hide in the corners and just want to like poo poo everything they see. Right. That's fine. Um, they're going to comment. They're going to say like, I don't wear those pants cause they have mesh pockets. And like, you're like, you, you sit there as a creator and you think, why did you take the time to actually tell us that you don't want them? Like you didn't have to buy them. Um, but not responding to those things negatively using any kind of negative comment or negative feedback as an opportunity, as a marketing opportunity, because your customers that will buy are going to read through those comments and also see how you handle criticism and what kind of customer service you're going to have. So you're basically demonstrating through all those comments and everything, the kind of company that you are and your policies on customer service and, and communication. So with that, we, I think we covered a lot. Um, spoke quickly through some things, uh, glossed over some things, got detailed in others. So I am very happy to answer questions and, um, uh, I will kind of ask my own question first. Caleb, do you want to moderate these uh, or do you want me to just go through and read? Um, I'm happy to, if you want me to, I mean, it's whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, Ayush has a couple of questions. Um, he, his first question is what assets, websites, flyers, et cetera, uh, do, do, need, do you need to have ready before you launch your campaign? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, Definitely a website, um, whether it's just a landing page, you can build a website. If it's never gonna, depending on what you're gonna do with it down the line, you can do it like a Squarespace or a Shopify. If it's a service or something, um, Squarespace is great. It's easy if it's ever gonna sell a product and sell multiple products, I would definitely do Shopify. Both of them have either free or very minimal startup costs and you can get a web domain for 10 bucks, um, usually. So definitely a website, um, definitely social channels. And social channels, like, I, it's a long burn strategy, um, but it is one that probably needs to be done. So I would have a social channel. I would go ahead and get an email system. Once again, MailChimp is probably the easiest, and it, it's also free to start up. It's free to like 2,000 people. So basically, if you don't ever get there, then great. You never have to pay for it. If you do, then you have emails, so you want to pay for it to keep them. Um, and I would take the time to link all those. So it's very easy. You know, if you do a social, you do Facebook and Instagram, you link them, post on Instagram, it goes to Facebook. You link your social media with a website, all of a sudden you have a website with dynamic content, right? Because every post you put on social media is now on your website. And so it just takes some time to link these. If someone signs up from your website or on social media, it's a drop into the same MailChimp list. Like you just don't want to have to do anything manual up front. I mean, long term, you want to do it all up front. Um, Flyers and all that, you know, yeah, I, we never did flyers, but if that's, that's a great way to do it, right? Like for local, if you have a place to go where your customers are congregated and you can actually give them something physical, that's great. I think our first or second campaign coincided with startup week um, for Startup Donkey and like the startup, the night we were vending was during our campaign. So we like put a big whiteboard up, put our campaign total with our goal and like said like, we're almost there. And like, we actually got people that night that never heard of, heard of us or never would have seen us to buy. So physical marketing and that is worth it. Yeah. And to it, so I, I would say, I would, the, I would uh, add just from my experience of, I think I first met you at a startup crawl a couple of years ago and you, you had the product, the prototypes there uh, and we're allowing people to sign up for, um, you know, the products or, you know, sign up for a newsletter. And I think that kind of being out in front of people went a long way And to Ayush's question, uh, about content. Um, would you say, uh, and you kind of touched on it, like the investment in content creation is probably one of the big keys to pre campaign. Would you agree? Yes. Uh, like 100%, you got to have good photos and like, there's more resources than I could probably give you to figure out how to do this right. But you'll need like, if it's a product, I'll just say it is for the sake of explanation, you'll need some like white background studio style shots, which you can do at home with like a sheet and some, you know, software. Um, you'll need some lifestyle shots like it in the field doing whatever it is, even if it's in an office. And then a video is going to tell your story. And so the content of the video is the most important thing by far. Like it can be, it could, the video could be me sitting right here. And that honestly works really well on Kickstarter sometimes. 
Kickstarter marketing, it seems like we've figured out re- responds better to authenticity than it does to like high va- production value. So we try to do high production value and I think you should, but like it's, it's the story. And so your, your video should be, you know, short, less than three minutes. It should tell very clearly who you are, what the product is, what it does and why it's better and why someone should back you. You don't need to put anything else in there. Um, yeah. So it's one part uh, content and then another part, I guess, community building around the story and the content. Right. Um, and I just had another question. Where did you find the marketing partner that you used? Um, the one that we're using now and the one that we will continue to use in the first feature, I did, went to the top grossing Kickstarter campaigns from Outdoor Apparel and you scroll to the bottom of the campaign of anything and you'll see who the marketing partners are. That's kind of just a tip. They go to the top grossing one, scroll to the bottom. The, the, every contract for all these marketing partners, partners starts with you have to put our banner at the bottom of your campaign. So that's how. And so uh, to your point, earlier point about looking at uh, similar products or services that have launched on Kickstarter uh, and emulating a lot of what they're doing, go look at their marketing partner too is probably part of that. Yeah, for sure. hundred percent. And Morgan and just go ahead and there- reach out early, by the way, because it took us, there's a, there was a 60 day tryout period for ours. And then they wanted three months from there to pre-market the campaign before it went live. So for ours, we needed to be five months ahead of time. Wow. Launch to even work with the partner we wanted to work with. So just keep that in mind. And Morgan asked, is there some kind of spend formula for uh, crowdfunding campaigns? For example, you should budget to spend some percentage of what you hope to raise for marketing. Yeah, there's like a rule of thumb, 10 to 15% is typically what's done around. Like you should expect to spend 10 to 15% of what you want to raise on mar- on paid advertising uh, for a campaign. You can go higher or lower and it depends on your, I mean, really a lot of things. In KCS, uh, what has the Kickstarter cu- customer retention rate been like from the first and second campaigns to the third one? You know, we're pulling this data right now, actually. We're trying to figure out exactly how many people came from first campaign to second campaign to third anecdotally it's high um and i know that from our comments on the campaigns our, our, our questions that come up saying like how did these fit compared to the first campaign and like third campaign they're like hey you know what are these like compared to the v2 versus the v1 right of our pants and and those kind of things and then also we also you know a big part of our audience um is people that have made from from previous campaigns and so it's been high we've also seen a, a pretty high and also, i don't i wish i had the numbers um but we've seen a pretty high conversion from a Kickstarter customer to a regular e-commerce customer. So a lot of times people will buy their first pair of pants. They'll buy one from the campaign because they haven't tried it on or whatever. They like it. They'll come back and buy two or three more from us online. And there's another question. Is there any way to get analytics to use in Kickstarter? Yeah. So Google analytics, you can drop a Google analytics ID kind of UA code into the campaign. And so you can set up a whole Google analytics, uh, property within Kickstarter so you can see where they're coming from, who they are, what, how age, what age they are, um, you know, where, like what referral they came from, if they came from Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, whatever. And I would highly recommend doing that because Kickstarter has its own analytics back end, but it is very rudimentary. Like if you really want to dive in and kind of know your, your market and be able to make changes, it's Google analytics. And I just had another question. Uh, any thoughts on SaaS businesses, Republic platform? Yeah, I actually talked to Republic um, about a crowd, equity crowdfunding campaign in the past. We almost did it, but we decided, you know, we we make a product. Um, we'll do Kickstarter. I think it's great. Um, I think they just recently raised the rules from the funding limit from like 1 million or 2 million to like five now or something. So you can actually get a full round done on there. Um, it's the same principles. It's almost all the same, except for there are some SEC regulations around marketing a uh, security. And I don't know exactly, but basically all the same principles, but just don't break the law. Um, is all I got to say about that because I haven't done it. Uh, Casey asks, how important uh, is having brand ambassador, how have brand ambassadors been in spreading awareness for lives and designs? How much did the version one customer feedback affect redesigns for version two and three? I guess those are two questions there. Yeah, cool. Well, the first one is uh, it very and and um, but maybe not in like a fully like you can gauge the ROI. But like, so our first brand ambassadors 
were given like a shareable link and a photo to share and some product if we could ahead of time to help motivate them. And that helps a lot with kind of that social proof. They're very likely to be some of your first backers too, right? Cause they're like invested kind of emotionally already before the thing. And they also want to tell their friends and if they didn't buy it, then um, they don't, you know, it didn't really feel authentic. So, um, but I won't say that like our brand ambassadors were anywhere near the most like biggest, like revenue driver on the campaign. It was, you know, email or paid or PR was probably bigger, but it's like, these are all kind of building blocks to brand trust. And the more people you have the back early and kind of talk about it and comment, and answer questions for you, which is one thing grand ambassadors are good for. If you, if you educate them well, before you even get a chance to reply to like a negative comment, someone else would be like, Hey, 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 now nah, they're cool. You know, and that's priceless. Um, so, you know, I don't know, it's hard to quantify from a revenue point of view, but definitely something to do if you can kind of have the bandwidth to do it. And the second question was, how did the version one customer feedback affect redesigns for version two and three? And a lot. Um, it was version one was really, really, really good, but had some flaws. The fit was a little off, um, like the thighs were smaller than they should have been for the waist size. and people were like, Hey, I'm not left-handed, which neither am I. I just put our knife pocket on the left because it's where I keep it. And like, like I want that pocket on the right. And so like we put it on both sides, right? People were saying that uh, after they got their pants hemmed on version one, that the roll up system was too low. So we actually edited kind of the way we grade where the button is for the roll up based on inseam length. So that if someone bought like, you know, it wouldn't come out with that problem. Um, and various feedback like that came in all the time. And, and when it kind of checked out with common sense and our own, my own experience with it, then yeah, we made those changes. So they've been very, um, helpful and also very helpful in building up social proof of like user reviews too. So our first campaign backers were the first ones we sent out like review request emails for our website saying like, Hey, you bought these, you wear them. Could you review them on our site? And it got us like our first 50 reviews and almost all of them were five star, even though they, there was some flaws, they knew that we were gonna fix, you know, that kind of thing, so they'd still help us out. And that kind of jump started a lot of social proof on our regular e-commerce selling after the campaign. And to uh, Casey's first question, just a thought I had, um, as far as brand ambassadors, your approach to, um, you know, reaching out to uh, folks in the media, like sending out products and having them kind of voice their um, thoughts on that, it feels almost kind of like that's, getting brand ambassadors from uh, media outlets was pretty critical too. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, that's almost priceless because it's people that know what they're talking about and, and people I think can, none of those were paid. So it's all editorial, right? Which is uh, organic and I don't call it organic cause we sent them to them, but like we didn't pay them for those re reviews. Um, and like, you know, the, basically the, to harken this way back to fundamentals, that's just about making a product that people like. Um, if they didn't like the pants, if they didn't want to wear them, if they didn't think they were cool, they would not have sent back those quotes. They would not have put their name associated with it. So whatever you do, it all starts with a very good product. And I wasn't, I wanted to make sure to say that just because like I said, like you can't just do that and expect success. You need the marketing side, but the marketing side doesn't work well if you don't have a good product to back it up. And especially that second sale, you can sell anything once you know, selling it twice to the same person is, is a matter of if they think it's good or not. And as a um, recovered journalist myself, there's a, a lot of value, I think, in having sent someone a product and asked for their feedback versus, you know, the approach that some might take and just say, here's a press release, write about my business. Like you took the approach that, you know, you offered them a chance to, you know, feel it, wear it, see it um, before kind of, you know, expecting some feedback. Um, I just had another question. Uh, what are your thoughts on influencers, say YouTube, TikTok, Instagram? Yeah, we've, uh, we haven't really done a lot of like paid influencer. Like we've found a couple people that like I followed, we followed that were really cool in our space and we've reached out and said, Hey, could you like kind of help us promote? And, and, um, one or two of them have said like, yeah, I'll just do it because we like what you're doing and we like the product. Uh, we've actually only paid an influencer one time and it's kind of still ongoing. And it's just cause he's a badass dude that travels the world in Jeep and it's like circumnavigated Africa. And he would just like, yeah, like, uh, I think these are cool. Um, so I, I can't answer it with like a bunch of knowledge on the sense that like, we're just not playing that game very hard right now. No, we're going much more kind of like 
ambassador and, and have, having helping our customers tell our story as opposed to an influencer, but we may start. So I don't, I'm not having against it. I think it really is useful and powerful if you just do it right. You can also throw a lot of money down the drain too, if you're not worried, not careful. Casey asks, how did you ship out the initial sticker orders, UPS and small envelopes or UPS, USPS, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, envelopes. Um, at first it was me stuffing into envelopes, like a little, I, I bought like a paper cutter um, and, and printed out a bunch of these little welcome letters on like, like, you know, like linen cardstock to make it look really nice saying like, you know, who we are. And then I sent out a sticker and I'd put them into an envelope and we used a, I don't have those around either, but uh, we use these like, I bought recycled envelopes from Amazon, you know, little uh, kind of cardstock or not cardstock, uh, craft paper brown. So they're being kind of branded and actually or went ahead and ordered a return label stamp. And I went to the US, the post office and bought like thousands of sheets of, or like sheets of thousands of uh, like the US airmail stickers or stamps that were really cool looking. And so I put some thought into that and then I stuffed a ton. And then I hired like everybody around me who was unemployed, like, can you come and like stuff envelopes? And I had this little like envelope assembly line in my back room of my house. And then I finally ended up paying a mail service down in South Fayetteville to, I said, here, please, like, just here's a list of people and here's a bunch of stickers, please get them there. And so like the kind of like, it started going out in like legal envelopes that were white. So like, you know, eventually I was like, I can no longer stuff an envelope. Like I have no more saliva to lick a thing. And, and, um, it got to be kind of a headache. And so I, so I was saying earlier, it was not scalable. Um, it was cool. We also, there's a, there's a big potential pitfall for giving away free stuff is that there's an entire world of websites and Facebook groups and, and everything dedicated to getting free stuff. And as soon as they pick up that you're giving away something free, all of a sudden your free offer will pop up all over the internet. And I started seeing names and addresses and stuff that I knew were not our customer, namely female names mostly. And I was like, these didn't come from our marketing. These came from somewhere else. So I started diving into it and realizing that we were on a lot of those. So we started actually took the whole offer down after a while because it was just, we're basically wasting money. We're just giving stuff to people who want free stuff, which is almost exactly opposite of our core message and customer group. <laughs> like you almost couldn't be more opposite. It's like, give me more stuff. And we're saying we want less stuff. So there's a potential pitfall there. Um, and, yeah, and Casey there, actually put it in there that, that it was on that subreddit a lot. Um, he also asked how influential was, uh, I'm not going to pronounce it right. Vaughn of, uh, Patagonia's business philosophy to your philosophy is, is Yvonne, Yvonne Chouinard, uh, very, uh, I've read his book, uh, let my people go surfing. I've listened to pretty much everything he said, um, as far as interviews and, and absolutely has been very influential on the my own personal philosophy the business's philosophy and the way in which we intend to grow now we have some key differences and, and uh he's very opinionated on certain things and uh, especially on a business model perspective that we are doing differently but yes i i think he's been amazing and he is an amazing person and the brand he's built is obviously incredible so i don't see any more questions in the chat or um on facebook at the moment so if you have a question, feel free, you're welcome to unmute now too, if you want to and ask your question. Shelby just said me. Go for it. Oh, looks like we lost her. Um, there's one more that came in. So how did you manage your time when first beginning? And uh, probably not as well as I should have. You know, it's just, I, I use different tools here and there. I use, you know, I pretty much use my calendar as my to-do list. I'll put little 15 minute meetings on there that say like, do this thing. Um, use Evernote for notes, use Google Drive for organization. And that's about as extensive as it gets for me. We're working on now some like productivity apps and things for the company, but you know, it's just kind of doing it. The other side too is uh, in general, just figure out what are the most important things that are going to drive you forward. If you don't do anything else and do those things <laughs> and let other people wait for emails longer than they should. If you've got to, you know, get the thing done. Like if you don't get the product done, you don't launch the campaign. So you got to get the product done, right? Like kind of identify those things. So that helps. Cool. And Shelby, Shelby, it looks like you're unmuted if you wanted to ask. I can't hear you, Shelby.
You look like you're somewhere cool though, like you're in a van. He's on a bus, in a bus, nice. Um, I can ask a question if uh, Shelby's typing, yes. Awesome. You go ahead. Hey, and, hey Andrew, thanks for um, the, the introduction and you know talking through the campaign, it's really helpful. So I was, uh, I was trying to approach this same thing uh, from the SaaS business perspective and trying to understand, you know, what other steps we got to take because it would certainly differ. So uh, when you are doing your campaign, like when you're starting, um, what is the timeline, if you don't mind sharing? Like say from the time you think that I have to do a campaign, starting from that day, how long it takes to launch the campaign and then you know, and are we assuming that the product already is done, like ready to go? Like kind of like, it's just, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd give yourself six months. I mean, you could do it in three, but you should really be building that audience three months out and getting that stuff done. So if you want to like get a marketing partner and kind of like and get photo and content and video done ahead of when you want to start marketing, then I would start six months ahead of time if you can. And, and would you recommend like a month of the year when it's good to campaign or, you know, like, time of the year because that would also impact the, the giving nature of people. <laughs> yeah, I would say, I would say basically avoid Q4. Um, so basically like no one wants to do anything except for shop around Black Friday and no one wants to do anything except for shop for Christmas around Christmas. And so if they can't get it and buy it and give it as a gift, then they're not going to really want to buy it before Christmas. So like we've done everything we did in like January or February. We were actually going to do it earlier um, this last year, but there was a, a big event uh, uh, going on to decide who was in the White House, right? So we just decided that we didn't want to go up against that news cycle. And even before that, we were trying to market kind of during the whole um, like Black Lives Matter movement. And like we were talking with our PR team, it's like, you know, like, is it really important to buy pants right now? Um, so you do have to kind of keep an eye on what's going on. But in general, I'd avoid Q4. And I have just one more question, and I know Shelby's question is there. But um, um, you said you had a 15, 14, 15,000 email, like people on subscribe to your emails. So is that all organic, like you built it out, or did you, how did you gather all that? A big part of it was sending out those uh, stickers, so ads. Um, another part of it is we did a couple partner giveaways. And in our space, like other brands, be like, you want to give away some stuff with us, and we'll give you all the emails we can gather. Um, we did that, and uh, and that's how we did it. And yeah, and I would also say that probably like sixty percent of those emails were kind of trash because they either came from like freebie websites and stuff like that that weren't exactly in there. So I will say that it was good. I will say that we could have done it better, and organic is better, a higher quality lead than anything you'll pay for. And it's like your your leads kind of go down in quality the more kind of separated from your target audience or you they get. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Yep. And Shelby asked, in regards to gathering emails, you mentioned running ads with a capture. Would you expand on this in regards to your personal techniques for this? Uh, did you run AB testing for ads or just focus on your company's mission and values? We just focus on the mission and values and try to keep it real simple at the beginning. Uh, we just put images of like the sticker on a water bottle on a guy holding it like this. Um, I wasn't, I was mainly doing those ads and I didn't, I didn't really know how or had the bandwidth to AB test. So we got a pretty good, like the return I thought was good from the beginning. So we just ran it. In general, I would definitely recommend AB testing things. <laughs> awesome. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, oh wait, and should we ask, are those on Facebook? Yes, that was almost entirely on Facebook. Awesome. If there are no more questions, um, we'll let everybody get back to their day. Uh, want to thank you, Andrew, so much for uh, taking the time to do this presentation for us and answer everybody's questions. This is incredibly valuable. Sure. Um, and for everybody watching, whether you're on uh, Zoom or you're on Facebook Live, uh, this is recorded. We're going to distribute this out to everybody uh, who signed up for the event. And feel free to share uh, with colleagues, friends. Uh, whoever um, that will go out to your email. We'll also put that up on our uh, Star Junkie uh, uh, website as well, where we, where all of our uh, YouTube videos live. So again, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, look forward to seeing everybody at the next event. Have a great afternoon. Cool. Thank you.